In this presentation, I'm telling, going to tell you the story of a building that was buried in sand for 400 years. And this was the salt gurnal or storehouse of Jean Gordon's late 16th century and early 17th century salt house. Now, as we've heard, a secure building to drain and store salt was an essential component of most salt works, with added imperative that merchants who were buying salt in bulk would often insist on old salt or salt that had been drained for at least three months so that they weren't spending money on water and also because sea salt has a tendency to, 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 re, to liquefy. Now, there are plenty of historical examples um, or references, I should say, to salt gurnals. But as far as I know, and someone may be able to put me right, there are no excavated examples. Um, I don't even know if there's an excavated example of a gurnal, actually. And as far as I know, there are no salt gurnals identified that date from this early period. Although, of course, some may be hidden in the fabric of later buildings. Now, this one is really quite special because after going out of use, probably sometime in late 1615 or early 1616, it was in a sand dune environment and it filled up with sand very, very quickly. So we do have archaeological evidence that the building was dismantled and emptied of anything of value. Um, but other than that, it was just left and everything in it was preserved in the sand. So it really is a time capsule of 17th, early 17th century life in Highland Scotland, in this part of Scotland, and probably uniquely of, of domestic life and life in an industrial context in Scotland. So a really quick review of the historical context and timeline. The first serious attempt to develop coal mining and the first person to establish salt making on the Sutherland estate was this woman, um, Jean Gordon. And I must say, she is a fascinating character in her own right. And I'm honoured to be holding the only advanced reading copy of Daughters of the North by Jennifer Henderson, who's in the audience. And this is a book about Jean Gordon, which would be published in February and um, if you look up Jennifer Morag Henderson, Google it and find Jennifer's website. And you can't buy an advanced copy yet, but um, you will be able to do so soon. <coughs> so Jean was managing the estate on, the, on behalf of her son, John the 12th Earl, and she established the salt pans. John, her, her son John was in France because of ill health. He returned in 1614. And here we have an indication that already the enterprise had run into trouble because he, re, he restarted the, uh, the, the coal mining and the salt pans. Now, John died from dysentery in 1615. And very soon after, the iron of the pans was sold off to help pay off estate debts. So we excavated the Gurnal in collaboration with many volunteers in Brora over 2010 and 2011. Uh, this is where the pans are. Jackie's already told you about the three phases of salt working. We're here under the red marker. And here's the, the site of Jean Gordon's uh, salt pans, 1598 to 1617. So that's where we are. They're pretty close and we'll be, be visiting them tomorrow. Um, these are the elements that we know of from this early phase of, 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 of salt pan. So we have the all, well, it's all about the coal. Um, here's our coal pit, an associated air pit, the gurnal that I'm focusing on, the remains of the pan house, which Jackie mentioned that was uh, documented on the beach in the early 2000s. Nothing, le nothing remains of it now. We also have a, the all-important seawater cistern or bucket pot. And I'm not going to pronounce the Gaelic, but this is the winter port. So also boat and ship access to the salt pans. So one of the reasons we know so much about the elements of, of these salt pans and, and the coal is because of John Ferry, who in 1813 made a mineral, mineral, mineral map um, for the Sutherland estate. And uh, many of these features were still extant or visible when he was surveying. So he, he marked them on a map. We've georeferenced his map. It georeferences perfectly, by the way. Um, and uh, so, so we, we're very confident about these elements of, 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 the, of the salt pans. So in that first year, um, we were aware that there was a building in the dune because this wall had been eroding for some time since the 1970s. Um, in that first year, we went in with big machinery and we, we just uncovered part of this building. Here's the front wall, the wall that's gone, and there's a closer view of a nice of the, of 
the, a large eastern room which was emptied out with its paved floor. Um, the lime kiln in the corner, by the way, is unrelated to this building in its original function. It was still probably 17th century and it was inserted, it, they were making use of a ruinous corner of a building as a handy place to build a lime kiln. The back beach of Brora is an industrial landscape. We're focusing on the salt, but of course there's coal mining and lime kilns as well. It's an industrial landscape. So here's a nice detail of the paved floor. These are locally sourced bituminous shale slabs bedded onto clean beach sand, just as described by Chris Watley at the salt gurnal at the Cock of Arran in 1712, where slabs were laid, described as laid upon clean beach sand to allow salt to drain. A very important discovery in 2010 were not only the building, but the layers of industrial waste, mainly fuel slag or clinker, lots of burnt sandstone and ash spread out westwards from the gurnal to the pan house um, on, on the beach. And this material was deliberately used to stabilise the sand dunes and to form like a clinker surface or a clinker road between the two buildings for horses, wagons and people. And the material was actually trodden over the thresholds. You could follow it as a, as a continuous layer. So we know those two buildings were in operation at the same time. The back wall survived till quite recently, nothing survives now. Here it is in the foreground with these piles of fuel slag behind it. In the second season of excavation, we um, revealed the whole structure. So we have, there's our large eastern room and a, a small western room here. In your mind's eye, you have to put back the paved flooring here. There's the lime kiln to orientate yourself. You see how coastal we are. So this is a rectangular building with a dividing wall, a chimney. For this period, I think quite unusual to have a chimney in an internal wall, a fireplace opening into the small western room, and also an external four-stair, which would have given access um, to an upper floor or to a loft. And here's the building in plan. So our interpretation as a gurnal um, is down to the, the, the floor, the plan of this building, its dimensions, also the quality of its build. Um, we're really lucky in that we're close, there's a close analogy to our building in Port Mahomac, which is um, a grain gurnal. Um, it's slightly later, it's late 17th century, but if you scale the plan of the Brora gurnal to the Port Mahomac gurnal, they're identical. And for those of you who take the catamaran to Orkney, you'll drive past this wonderful example in, in St Mary's, um, which could be contemporary with ours if the date is correct. I don't know how, I don't know on, on what basis the 1608 date comes, but it's an early gurnal. So these are expensive buildings, okay, for the time. They um, are designed to impress, they hold the wealth of the estates. They, are, they have ashlar margins, stone architraves, um, they usually have slate roofs. Our, our example in Brora is a bit early for slate. We would have had a turf or a heather roof. Expensive lime mortar was used to bond the masonry. And we can see that in our building. So we're here, we're in the small west room. We're, we're actually below the floor level here. So we have, this is our foundation course of unmortared boulders. Then we have um, the harling. Well, the harling is well preserved for the first metre because it was filled up with sand so quickly. This building, you wouldn't have seen stone in this building, it would have all been covered in a, in a lime harling. Um, all of these boulders are collected from the beach, near, like literally next to, the, next to the gurnal, roughly squared off and the chippings used to fill round the boulders, except for the fireplaces and the doorways which are Brora sandstone quarried at Spooty, which is about a kilometre down the beach at Strathstephen, Strathstephen Quarry. Stake holes in the floor are evidence of scaffolding for the construction phase. All the wood we found on site was Scots pine, so that would have been sourced from the Sutherland estate. So all of the materials used to construct this building were probably sourced within a mile or even a kilometre of where it stands. So it, in that sense, it's a vernacular building. However, some details do reflect the reach and the connections of the Sutherland family. So as is common in, in gurnals where ventilation and security are very important, we found windows in our gurnal, sm uh, small shuttered windows. 
But what's really unusual in Brora was the discovery of many, many fragments of window glass. So this is incredibly rare for a building of this period in Scotland. And in fact, there's no evidence that glass was made from raw materials in Scotland before 1610. So our glass must have been imported. Robin Murdoch assisted us with a chemical analysis of the glass. Um, we looked at man well, no, I say we. The manganese oxide ratios um, were, were matched very closely to an English heritage dating model of glass dating from 1557 to 1600. So that fits with our period. And further chemical analysis by Helen Spencer in her PhD research identified the likely source of the glass as either Eastern France, Belgium or Flanders. Um, it's really tempting to link the manufacturing region of the glass with um, the, the, conne the connections of uh, uh, John the Twelfth Earl and his, and his brother Robert Gordon, who travelled extensively in Europe for their education. So another unusual find in the building was <coughs> these symbols carved into the stone architraves around the doors and the fireplace. So. These are formal symbols on the doorways. They look quite like Mason's marks. They're, um, they're quite identical and carved in the same place. Round the fireplace, we have uh, in more informally carved monograms and symbols, um, which are more weathered and difficult to see. Now, there are a range of possible interpretations of these symbols. Um, obviously, Mason's marks comes to mind. These were commonly used by craftsmen of the period, both as banker's marks and as assembly marks, very commonly used as assembly marks. Very, very closely related to Mason's marks are, of course, owner's marks or merchant's marks, also in very common use in this period to identify property when few, few people um, could read and write. Um, in fact, merchant's marks are the origins of trademarks. Also at this period, though, we have to throw into the mix um, so-called apotropaic marks or witches' marks, um, which uh, were again in fairly common usage at this time in parts of Scotland. So fear of wit witches was at its peak at the turn of the 17th century, and these marks were carved around openings in windows to ward off evil or bad luck. Now, as with many things in life, um, there's probably not an either or explanation for these marks. I'm really drawn to a theory by Timothy Easton, who's done extensive research in this field in England. And he's, he has concluded that the majority of these early ritual marks were carved by craftsmen during the construction job or a repairing job. The symbols were a personal ritual and possibly a necessary requirement to protect a new building or structure. And they were just drawing on symbols that they used in their, in their common work. So they're, they're a, a useful symbol and also um, used for a ritual pr protection. The symbols on the doorways could be estate marks. I'd be very interested to anyone local who's done any sort of research into this. Um, we need to find more examples um, to verify that. So now let's turn to what was found in the Gurnall. We recovered thousands of items, almost all relating to food and also a lot of metalworking. There were a few shards of pottery from lead glazed jugs from a production centre in Aberdeenshire, so there might be a Gordon connection with Huntley in Aberdeenshire, and also a locally made jug from a clay sort, well, from a pottery, a local pottery that no one has found yet. A hunting arrow as well, that was an unexpected find. Um, in terms of the metalwork, all manner of objects were found, mainly nails, say bolts, plates, lumps, strips, um, but also, very importantly, smithing slag and fragments of smithing hearths. And these were found in both the construction and in the use phases of the building. So it shows us a smith was working in this building and a smith was as essential in assault pans as a salter. There would be continuous running repairs to the pans, to structures in the building and to the buildings themselves. By the way, the iron ore would have been sourced from bloomeries on the estate, and the closest bloomery to here is, is only eight miles away in Gordon Bush of, for this period. Turning to the food remains, I mean, they were, again, extremely abundant, uh, trodden into floors, also in middens, which were piled over the forestair, which was giving access to an upper floor. That what's in bold is the most common foods eaten, but you can see the range of, the range of animals and fish eaten. 
Um, the animal bone was highly fragmented, so a lot of stews were being consumed. It was thrifty cooking, um, a very wide range of fish sources. Um, interestingly, no salmon because that would have been completely off, you know, off limits for ordinary people. The fish is showing that uh, most of it was found in construction phases. That's just preservation bias. Just fish bone that ended up under later uh, stone floors was preserved and so we have loads of it. So, the food remains are telling us that as well as a specialist storage building and as well as a place where smiths were at work, it was also a place where people lived. So to recap, or to sum up, the materials of the building itself embodies the resources of both the Sutherland estate and in things like the glass, the reach and connections of the family. This was a specialist building for the secure storage of an expensive product, but the finds show us that it was also a place of work, in particular smithing and metalworking, and it, the, the food remains show us it was a domestic space. The carved symbols uh, show us, you know, a, a blurring of possible, well, I might be stretching this, a blurring of the ritual with the practical. Um, there is a juxtaposition here of an expensive, high status, quality building with what to our modern sensibilities would probably be pretty squalid living conditions. There was an awful lot of animal bone and dead fish, you know, trodden into the floor. We can imagine living here, the custodian whose job it was to um, look after and protect um, um, the salt. Servants, a cook obviously, smiths and other workers from the pans, and also possibly from the associated coal mine would be using this building. Um, maybe not everyone would be living here all the time, but maybe living here for a local estate tenantry who were um, hauling carrying salt or local craftsmen and servants might have used this building for short periods. Specialist workers from elsewhere might have been accommodated in these, in these buildings, which are uh, uh, sort of in a multi-purpose way. What the finds do show us, I think, is they were well provided for. I don't think these people were going out catching their own fish and, and farming their own animals. They were being provisioned. So the estate was presumably looking after this range of workers here. This is um, the site two years later after a storm in 2012. So this is very important what Brora has done because by drawing these remains to bringing them to attention, it's allowed us to rescue the story um, of these buildings and really instigating this much larger programme of research inve and investigation. So thank you.